Well, hello, Adult Sunday School Leader. I hope you're having a great week so far. Now, here in Southeast Arkansas, we have had a little bit of a reprieve on Monday and Tuesday from those hot and humid temperatures. Uh, but wherever you are, I hope that you're able to tolerate these summer temperatures as we approach the month of July. Well, freedom and independence. These are two qualities of our country that we are so proud of and that we celebrate this time of year, don't we? In fact, next Monday is July 4th, which we call Independence Day. But you and I both know that freedom doesn't mean that we're free to do whatever we want. You know, there are limits to our freedom. I have the freedom to play music in my house whenever I want to. But when I play that music so loudly that it disturbs my neighbors, especially at night, then I've crossed that line. Now, this is true in our Christian lives as well. We are free in Christ. We are free from the law. But when the things we are free to do, when that becomes a stumbling block to another person's journey with Christ, then we should be concerned enough for that person to put their spiritual needs above our own. Now, in Christ, we are also independent. That is, we don't have to go to an, to an intermediary to gain access to the throne of God. We can go directly to him in prayer. Yet, we're created to be relational beings. We need relationships with others as we journey through life. So that's what we're looking at this week in our Sunday School lesson. It's a special focus lesson. It's called Interdependent Independence. It's out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. And the point of the lesson is this. Let your responsibility to others drive how you exercise your rights. Well, as we look in the first couple of verses of our lesson text this week, it appears that Paul is addressing a belief that some folks may have had, and that is, since they were free from the law, they could do whatever they wanted. Now, Paul already addressed this concept back in chapter 6, verses 12 through 15, which, which say this, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Well, in chapter 6, Paul's addressing a, a libertine philosophy, that is, the thought that as, as you've heard it said, I have my fire insurance, right? I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to hell. I've got my fire insurance so I can live like I want to, including sexual immorality. But before we get too harsh with the Corinthian church and look down on him, let's remember the culture of that town, right? The greatest building in that city was the temple to Aphrodite, the goddess of, of love and beauty. And it's, it's her name that the word aphrodisiac comes from, a drug that stimulates sexual desire. It was said that there were a thousand male and female prostitutes at all times at that temple. But these weren't necessarily willing people dedicated to their goddess. No, they, they were sex, many of them were sex slaves purchased by wealthy Greeks uh, and given as an offering to the temple. Now, th there was a Greek geographer, his name was Strabo, who wrote uh, this around the year uh, AD 20. He said this, the temple of Aphrodite was, was once so rich that it acquired more than a thousand prostitutes donated by both men and women to the service of the goddess. And because of them, they, the, the city used to be jam-packed and, and became wealthy. The ship captains would spend fortunes there, and so the proverb says, the voyage to Corinth isn't just for any man. But during that time, there was also a phrase in Paul's day. It was, the, the phrase was, to Corinthianize which meant to practice sexual immorality. So that was Corinth. That was the Amsterdam of its day. That's the city that these Christians were living in. Now, of course, we know Jews who became followers of Jesus, they at least had a background of the Mosaic Law, which we call the Old Testament, as their moral compass, but the Gentiles didn't have that background. Here in Corinth, they came out of this culture of sex-saturated Corinth. But, as we'll see in our lesson text this week, Paul isn't mentioning anything that's immoral. But the practice of freedoms that a Christian is allowed to do, but maybe should sometimes forego for another's benefit. And that's exactly what Paul says in verse 24. 
that no one should seek their own good but the good of others. Now, verses 25 through 30, Paul gives an example of, of meat being sold in the market. Okay, Now, this is different than what he wrote about in chapter 8, which was about eating meat in the idol temples. Right? That, had, <clears throat> that, had, uh, that meat had been definitely sacrificed to that temple's deity. In our verses here this week, Paul doesn't re- repeat, but he expands what he wrote uh, about just two chapters before. In the markets... Some of the meat that was sold was previously sacrificed before an idol. Some wasn't. You really couldn't tell by looking, could you? So Paul told the Corinthian church not to be so fussy and holier than thou, that's kind of my interpretation there, of trying to pick out only the unsacrificed meat. And the reason is given in verse 26, which is a quote from Psalm 24, verse 1. And just like Paul had mentioned in chapter 8, an idol's nothing but wood, nothing but stone, has no effect on the person's physical or their spiritual being. However, if you're invited to a friend's house and the host specifically mentions that the meat before you was sacrificed to an idol, Paul said not to eat it. Don't touch it. Don't eat it. Not because it's going to be harmful to you, right? It's not going to be able to do anything to you. It's not going to make you spiritually um, inferior or, or affect you physically but it could be harmful to the one who is offering it to you, your host. Now, why is that? It's because uh, showing even the littlest, the tiniest bit of support to idol worship might confuse your host as to where you stand as a Christian. You see, the believer is to show that they have nothing to do with idols, that they worship God alone. Now, almost every state in our United States has a state lottery, and I believe there's only six states that, that don't. And being that an official stance of Southern Baptists is that gambling should be avoided, a question you might ask your class is this. Should the church accept tithes from gambling winnings? That's a good one to ask. You're going to get some discussion on that on both sides. Now, in my state, the state of Arkansas, the proceeds uh, from that state lottery help benefit college scholarships for Arkansas residents. If you really want to get into a discussion, you might ask this. Should Christian parents accept lottery money, scholarship money, for their college-bound children if that money comes from the proceeds of gambling? I encourage you to have fun with that question. Our last set of verses is 31 through 33. And Paul said, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether it's eating, drinking, working, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And what would bring glory to God? You're doing something because you you have the freedom to do so, or foregoing that right in order to be a witness to someone, hoping to draw them closer to God in the process. And then Paul told his readers not to cause anyone to stumble, whether they're Jews, Greeks, or church folks. Now guess what? That's everyone, isn't it? Well, just like Paul also wrote in Philippians 2.3, He said this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Just yesterday, I was driving my wife to her oncologist appointment. And as we were traveling along the interstate, I was in the the right-hand lane. I had every right to be there. I didn't have to get over for anyone. However, there were cars on the on-ramp trying to get on, trying to merge onto the interstate. Now, there were no cars to the left of me, either you know, real close to me or right behind me. No, cl- no cars close to me in that left-hand lane. I didn't have to get over. I could have stayed in that right-hand lane and forced those oncoming drivers to slow down and wait until I passed in order for them to merge. But I didn't do that. <laughs> I yielded my right, and I switched over to the left-hand lane, allowed them to enter smoothly onto the road, it didn't cost me anything, and the overall traffic moved more smoothly than if I had uh, hard-headedly stayed in that right-hand lane. Well, here's some closing thoughts for you. We're not to ask, what can I do, but what should I do in a situation? We're not to ask what's legal, but what's best, right? We're not to ask, What can I do because I have the freedom to do so? But what should I do to draw others to Christ so they can experience freedom? In Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, Paul says this, 
You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, next week, we're going to get back to that unit on the Holy Spirit, looking at walking with the Spirit out of Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25, which that text is right after the verses I just read. So, as we close, don't forget to pray for and with your class, and try to stay cool this week. Thank you guys for watching.